So how did this new technology affect education? Early on, there wasn't much of an effect in the classroom, honestly. But because you have to consider that it was almost 70 years after film began that consumers had handheld cameras. Yet some schools used projectors starting in the 50s, some even in the 40s. Mainstream, mainstream use wasn't until much later. One place to get films for schools was the National Film Library. They rented out films, but the catch was somebody at your school actually had to be a licensed film projectionist before you were allowed to rent any films from them. Besides from the National Film Library, you could rent movies or buy movies from a few different film companies that started up just for this sole purpose. Since some of these projectors were available for schools, there was a lot of money to be made. Cornette Films is an example of one of the companies that was designed specifically for this purpose, and their films were shown in American schools starting in about 1941. The company was deeply interested in visual education and the power of film to teach and convince, and they built a full studio on their estate in Illinois. At the height, 100, years, or 100 films were cranked out each year. The films were sold to schools and libraries by a network of distributors that were quite successful. They created movies to help guide young people on topics such as dating, family life, being courteous, and being a good student, being a good citizen. Some films were much more educational in nature, such as the ones on the solar system and the human body. So there did start to be an influence that these films had in education in the 50s, 50s, 60s, and more so even into the 70s when more and more schools had projection. Projection. What other problems does this new technology cause? According to John F. O'Connor in History and Images, Images and History, that since the 1930s, film and television have become the major factors in politics and culture of America. And what O'Connor argues is that the problem is historians give little weight to what is seen, on, seen and heard on television. Yet once their students graduate, few of them will probably ever pick up a scholarly journal again. Their education beyond college will mainly come from what they see on television and film. O'Connor says that we should devote at least some time teaching people to be informed, critical viewers of historical film and television. But what television and film and moving images have done is it forced our culture to challenge taboos. We saw earlier the kissing on, on the, one of the first films and how that was a you know, public outrage. But then we have our ideas on war, our ideas of diversity, our ideas of women. All of these are being shaped by moving images and by film and by you know what we see on television or see in the movie theaters so these all could be a problem if not uh, watched carefully the farce of prohibition but in spite of these mistakes our conversation of moving images cannot end without at least a reference to Ken Burns Ken Burns is a filmmaker that is current today but is famous for using still pictures he actually created an effect called the Ken Burns effect that Apple uses in their iMovie product and basically it takes a still picture and scrolls from left to right or up to down uh, or you know zoomed in on something and pull it back out uh, it's just manipulating a still image and giving it a sense of movement uh, he won many awards in his time that he's been producing but it's probably one of the most famous for his first one like 1980 called the Civil War and it's once again taking still images of things that happened a long time ago from the building of the Brooklyn Bridge to the Civil War all kinds of things and actually adding movement to them so that they're not as boring as maybe just watching a slideshow on TV of course he adds 
audio and music and everything else to him, but he is one of the most impressive uh, producers that use still images to create movies. The Civil War was fought in 10,000 places, from Valverde, New Mexico, and Tullahoma, Tennessee, to St. Albans, Vermont, and Fernandina on the Florida coast. More than three million Americans fought in it. And I just couldn't resist to leave you with this last bit of driver's ed training video uh, where you'll learn about the future drivers are today's young children and so please be inspired by James Stewart as he teaches you all about this. Ah, there goes Mr. Speed King himself passing on a curve. Hey, what's the matter lady? Your arm broken? Hey, hey what's the big idea? All right, pull over there, Jack. You need to hog the whole road. Lady, 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 that stop sign means you. What you're saying is one of the most interesting and important experiments in driver education today. And it proves that some people really do drive like six-year-olds. And here's the real thing. Real tires with real air in them, headlights that work, a horn that blows. This car, mounted on blocks, is called the Phoenix Link Trainer, patterned after the famous aviation trainer on which so many pilots learn the fundamentals of flying without leaving the ground. Now, while he's learning, young Mr. Future Driver may rack up quite a few miles without going anywhere. But one proud day, there's that temporary driver's permit as a reward for all the hours of practice. This is it, even though it's only a beginner's driving course. Yeah, the first time behind the wheel of the one boy power automobile in motion. But driving is a privilege that must be earned. Young Jimmy, for example, he had the idea that school was just about as bad as prison. And maybe if he absolutely refused to study, he might be sent home. And then he found out that no school, no driving. Today, Jimmy isn't exactly a top student, but he's in there trying. With the help of the older students, tomorrow's drivers learn how to take care of their cars before they drive on the advanced course. The advanced driving course has just about everything that the American motorist encounters in his driving about town and across country. Highways, city streets, crosswalks, pedestrians, traffic signals and policemen. And, of course, country roads and detours. Everyone takes his turn at being driver, pedestrian, or policeman. Traffic violators get tickets and are brought to trial before a jury of the classmates. Now, crime just doesn't pay. This batch of hot rodders have had their licenses suspended for a day. At a most impressionable time of life, an important rule of society is learned. Laws are meant not to restrict, but to protect. For three years in the first, second, third grade, children learn through actual experience the reason for safety laws. They develop self-confidence and the respect for the rights of others. Courtesy and cooperation and sportsmanship are practiced until they become habits. Once established, these habits pay off. And when tomorrow's drivers outgrow the small cars, safety on two wheels is stressed in the Phoenix program in preparation for the day when actual driving instruction begins.